time. Let's click. And I have been a JVM engineer for over a decade. Um, been uh, sort of key roles in making Hotspot um, fast enough that it was good enough that you could do all kinds of interesting things with it. And Java took off, which is still sort of amazing to me that it did. Um, but I feel like I had a, a real hand in making that possible. Um, and then, you know, looking at what goes in that JVM, I'm sort of always amazed. And the, the sort of the set of things that have been in the JVM has been increasing slowly over time. And many times when something new appears is because uh, there was some naive change in the specs and somebody said, ooh, finalizers are a great idea. Or, you know, whatever, pick your poison du jour. And suddenly the VM engineers are up for this world of hurt. So over time, we've picked up just huge count of services. Um, there's definitely everyone relies on the high quality GC. Uh, these days, you know, parallel um, concurrent collections are just, you know, the de rigueur, you have to have them. Um, the actual efficiency is quite good. So compare this to the overheads of running malloc and free and other alternatives, and you can see that GC costs are actually very reasonable, although you have to deal with this annoying pause thing that runs around. Um, there's machine code generation. Along with the, the high quality machine code that's generated, there's actually code management lifetime issues. There's a lot of code profiling that goes on. And really the, the service that people are getting out here is as a cost model for bytecodes. People expect get field, put field bytecodes are cheap. They turn into a load somehow magically under the hood, right? There's a uniform threading and memory model, you know, with all that goes with it. I can just say new thread on any kind of machine from a cell phone to a supercomputer and something happens that works, right? There's type safety in the language, there's, you know, in the VM and all throughout, there's, there's just a ton of services. Dynamic class loading, you don't have to see the whole program at once. This is not ecstatic pre-compilation. This is, I'm going to load code. And when I say, you know, as a service, what it means is not only can I load new code, but it's going to be in, in conjunction with all the other services. It's going to continue to have that high quality bytecode cost model. I can load new code. It's just as efficient, just as fast as the old code that's been there. And the old code didn't get any worse, and the new code's just as fast. So it's always the case that you can pile on more code. It's still fast. And sometimes that means you have to take your old code, deoptimize, rejet. These are all hard problems. Turns out that stupidly that getting high quality time access is a big issue in Java programs. You would think that something as simple as getting time is easy, and the answer is no, it is not. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. There's a thousand introspection services. I'm listing a few. There's this huge pre-built library, and of course you get access to all the standard OS services. Um, just expect. So where did all this stuff come from? Well, the answer sort of, it sort of incrementally got added over time. The language, the Java language, the JVM that supported it, the hardware the JVM ran on, you know, so this is the, this piece and this piece changed, and this is the bridge between them, and that piece had to follow along as the bridge, right? They all co-evolved. And so you get sort of the incremental addition of lots of new features, like finalizers or 64-bit pointers, 64-bit heaps. Java memory models, some of the bigger ones. Support for very high core count machines. Um, really, you know, why did we go this route? Why did we add these services? Because these services provide an illusion of a hardware-based programming platform that's really powerful. It's the V in the JDM, right? It's a great abstraction. Programmers can sit on this nice base and focus on value-added elsewhere. And the JVM provides a bunch of services that people just take a sort of a, a, a base layer of programming going forward, right? So the selection of services, though, has been sort of ad hoc, added on over time. Um, many of these services are unique to the requirements of Java or the JVM itself. Many of the services overlap with pre-existing OS services, but sometimes they have different requirements so that they don't exactly match the OS service and therefore the JVM had to do something very similar to what an OS does, but not quite, because it's, <laughs> um, not quite, because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the right thing. All right, so that was the intro. And now I'm gonna talk about some of the illusions that JVMs provide. If illusion's the right word, I don't think it is here. So one of the illusions, the obvious one, is the illusion of infinite memory. You just say new and you get something, right? Garbage collection, right? Do not track your lifetimes, do not bother with free, just say new, 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 billion times a second, new. And you always get more memory. 
And eventually, of course, you run out, and JC figures out what's alive and what's dead, and sorts it all out and hands you back more new space. Vastly easier to use in malloc and free, which turns out to be uh, you know, timely market issues, get rid of your bugs. Uh, in fact, it turns out that you get certain kinds of concurrent algorithms, which are just too hard to track liveness of uh, pieces parts from. GC just fixes in a way that you, know, you just can't do with malloc and free. GC has made these huge strides in the last decade, right? These days, uh, it's, it's you know, production ready, in use in production systems, people's business 100 companies rely on this stuff on a daily basis. You know, parallel, concurrent, yada, 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 buzzword enabled. Um, GC remains a major user pain point. Uh, if I look at a standard Java um, uh, uh, production installation of some large Java app, they usually have 20 or more GC flags. I've seen upwards of 50 garbage collection flags. It's like insane there, right? And these people are trying to scroll around with GC pause times and running out of perm gen versus running out of this or that, or their CMS collectors getting behind and then they have a major pause because CMS can't keep up or they have to defrag the heap or whatever it is. Major user pain point, major vendor <coughs> point of differentiation. A lot of vendors are uh, actively working to make GC better still. Um, so it's under active development. And you can see it in the sort of the offerings. This is sort of a uh, three obvious offerings at the ends of the spectrum. Um, pause times are in this offerings are differing by six orders of magnitude. It's a huge range, right? So Azul will give you a system where it'll handle hundreds of gigs with a 10 millisecond pause. And IBM Metronome will hand you hundreds of megs, and then you, uh, someone from IBM can correct me here, with like 10 microsecond pauses. So this is definitely down into the hard real time domains, right? And the stock uh, parallel collector, it, when it gets up to like tens of gigs, we'll start seeing tens of seconds of full GC pauses, although they're relatively rare. And so in between you know, here and here, there's like the six orders of magnitude with a large variation throughput according to which collector is being used. And then you, know, you add your 20 or 50 GC flags and things get tuned left and right all over the place. So this is a major point of people you know, working on making this even better, right? Okay. Another illusion, bikers are fast. So you know, just taking a step back, I look and say, what am I doing with bytecodes? I am passing around program semantics from one place to another. I'm reading off the disk the meaning of your intended program. Um, you know, it's a serialized form of program semantics, and they sort of suck bytecodes as a way to describe semantics, but hey, we're stuck with them for now. Right? The main win is I don't care too much about CPU details. It's the other major way we pass around program semantics is an x86 binary. So, you know, over x86 binary bytecodes are a lot better, but I can imagine better ways. Okay, fine. So programmers expect them to be fast, and of course it's a big illusion because, you know, you, there's no real machine runs these bytecodes, so they would otherwise be interpreted, which of course would be really slow, but except that of course you jit them, and jit them springs them back to the expected cost model, right? And so the, the mapping of Java bytecodes to machine code is done by these high quality optimizing compilers, and these are amazingly complex beasties in their own right. So you know, a Java virtual machine is this enormous you know, product of our generation of, of huge, difficult thing. It's the Hoover Dam of our generation. Internally, it has things that were considered amazingly complicated from the prior generation. So optimizing compilers have been around since the 50s and 60s, and they were considered at that time sort of the largest, most complicated things on the planet. Now they're a subsystem of a JVM, right? So we're getting out of this uh, a decent optimizing compiler uh, is brought sort of to the masses. You know, if I look at the number of times people invoke a compiler on the planet, probably you know Java or GCC are going to be the two main ways you get compilation. But maybe even Java wins here because you don't actually say go compile. You say, oh, just run my bytecodes, and mysteriously under the hood for you, a highly optimized compiler is running away. And so you know we have delivered high quality optimizing compilation to the masses without the masses realizing they're getting it. Um, we can't, of course, pick up just GCC-style <laughs> classic compilers directly because there's new requirements because they don't match you know, the old stuff. You have to track pointers for GC. You have to deal with the Java memory model, which has strong requirements on where you put fencing in, where you can have loads and stores, what kind of reorderings you can do, has rules about scheduling. And then there's lots of new fun patterns to optimize, things that didn't matter for C and C++ matter, matter a whole lot for Java. And so you have different things you need to go optimize for. <coughs> I see a lot of people. Can people see the bottom few lines? Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me. 
Is that better? Thank you. Should have done that five slides ago. Okay. Um, another thing we get out of this is that we're going to profile, and that's because JD requires profiling because you don't actually compile everything. You uh, focus on the hot stuff, and that means you need at least a little bit of profiling to tell hot from cold. And it turns out that profiling, just in general, allows better code quality. Um, that's been known for a long time, but it's too hard to do sort of feedback-directed compilation uh, for sort of real-world use. It's only been used by vendors doing spec and spec FP, you know, max, max benchmark scores. But it turns out in the land of Java, you get profiling sort of on a daily basis, uh, profile-directed feedback. And that profiling feeds right back into the jitting process to decide not just what gets compiled, but what gets inlined into what, how much loop unrolling to do, when to trigger heavier weight optimizations like range check elimination, uh, you know, which way the branches are going to predict so you do code layouts that match, all that kinds of stuff. Really, we're getting profile-directed feedback compilation brought to everybody when you just say, Java, go run it. So, I don't know if you're getting to this, but the testing and bug tail implications of this stuff are pretty interesting. Okay, yeah, so let me, let me, let me cover that real quick here. So, so, one of the rule issues with profile-directed feedback is it puts your compiler in this mode that's not run on a daily basis by millions of people if you're, you know, if you're a C or Fortran guy. So the sort of production use of people doing profile-directed feedback has been really limited to uh, benchmarks because um, it's so hard to use in your daily environment that people don't do it. And then because it hasn't been used in your daily environment, it represents a real risk at a product that the compiler has a bug in the profile-directed feedback mechanism, which is otherwise only used for benchmarks. So people don't use it to ship code. It's too risky. Um, you go to Java, it is the default. You do profile-directed feedback every time you compile. So this path is the normal, it's the default, it's the everyday path. It has been, the bugs have been beaten out of this path. And that's sort of the difference between uh, the use cases for people who are doing it for one-off benchmarks and people doing it every day. OK. Another illusion, virtual calls are fast. <coughs> C++ basically avoids virtual calls. Um, they make it not the default. You have to ask for them. Um, and that's because they're considered slow to do it on, a, on a, you know, every call site being virtual, right? Java embraces them. They're on by default unless you ask for them not to be there, unless you say final. Um, and so the JITs make them fast. Um, and of course, they didn't start out being made fast. They just, it was observed that they had to be made fast to make Java run fast and people optimize for them, right? To make so, small talk run fast. Um, okay, yes. <laughs> Deutsch Schiffman 84. And there's even Deutsch Schiffman comments in the hotspot source code where those optimizations kick in. So class hierarchy analysis, right? CHA turns most virtual calls into static calls. And then, of course, you can inline. And then, of course, the class hierarchy changes, so you have to track it over time. Um, and you may need to deoptimize and reach it if your assumptions about what the layout was change. And when you can't do CHA, uh, people do inline caches. Uh, and then only if inline caches fail do you go back to having sort of a full-on virtual call. And sort of the answer here uh, is that the number of times dynamically you do an actual real virtual call is sort of vanishingly small. If I make you know load, 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 jump register, be fast on some fancy piece of hardware, it will not make Java run any amount faster because that doesn't happen. You know, dynamically speaking, those are much less than 1% and I have a billion instruction traces which say so. Um, 